good evening. I just want to say how much I appreciate your faithfulness to our evening services. You know, I mentioned this morning <clears throat> how often I'd been given the privilege to preach on that trip to London. But what was humbling is anytime I felt a little tired was to walk out at lunchtime and to see the people still sitting in the pews with a sack lunch that they had brought. I mean, they sat there all day long, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And um, you know, that's a hunger that God produces in a people. But we're thankful for it, aren't we? Thankful for people who love God and love His Word. If you would please join with me in turning to the book of Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1. And we continue our study through this letter and we come again to verse 5, we'll read down to verse 9, dealing with the qualifications for elders, Titus chapter 1 verse 5. Paul writes, this is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So far we have seen that the men who are to serve as elders are to be examined, they're to be tested in the area of their family life, above reproach when it comes to the matter of, of marriage, above reproach when it comes to managing a household. So how does this man raise his children? Is his home in order? Is he able to keep his children in submission with dignity? He's to be examined with respect to his home life. And then we talked about the fact that he's also to be examined respecting his personal life. And there we are given several characteristics that are to uh, be true of this man in his personal dealings with others, not arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. This is what is to characterize the man's personal life. So the men who are being examined for eldership, examined regarding their home life, examined regarding their personal life, and now we come to a third area where these men are to be tested. This area, I believe, is, is the preeminent one. This is the one that stands at the head of the ones that have already been mentioned because if this one is in place, the man will have a desire regarding the first two. If this one is not in place, the man will not be genuine in the first two areas that have been mentioned. This issue, this, this matter that I believe is preeminent above the others can be put this way, what is the man's devotion to God's Word? What is his devotion to God's Word? And of course, that, that expresses his devotion to God. What is his devotion to God and to God's Word? Verse 9 says, he must hold firm to the trustworthy Word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. This, as we'll see this evening, this not only has to do with the work of the ministry, this also has to do with the very kind of man you're examining. What kind of man is he? A man who loves God and His Word is a man who wants to be faithful in his home life. A man who loves God and His Word is a man who wants to be faithful in his personal life. And so that's why I say, again, I think this is the preeminent one. 
And this evening as we consider this, this last test, what I want us to see together are three certainties concerning faithful ministry and faithful ministers. Three certainties concerning faithful ministry and faithful ministers. A man who serves as an elder in the church must be committed to sound doctrine. And that personal commitment then flows out in ministry commitment and flows out in faithful shepherding. We'll see that this evening. Three certainties concerning faithful ministry and faithful ministers. And the first thing I want to point out from verse 9 is, in this verse, we, we learn something certain about Scripture. Look at verse 9 and ask yourself, what does it teach us about Scripture? Before we think about this man's relationship to Scripture, what does verse 9 teach us about the Word of God itself? One of the things that stands out in verse 9 is, is the fact that God has given revelation in words. This man must hold firm to the trustworthy word, uh, the trustworthy message as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. As he holds fast to the word of God, he is able to be a faithful instructor to the church. The fact that Paul can make mention of sound doctrine or healthy doctrine and talk about this word that a man clings to reminds us that God has actually given revelation in words. He has, he has made the truth known and He's communicated the truth to us in human language. The God who made all things, controls all things, rules over all things, has communicated with His creatures. He has given us words that can be read. Isn't that an amazing privilege? That God not only gave His Word, but He has preserved His Word. He has inscripturated His Word so that now we can read His Word. And when we reflect back on the history of the church and we're reminded there was a time before the printing press, when there was a time when believers like us, uh, each person didn't have his or her own copy of the Scriptures. What a privilege it is that we hold a Bible in our hands tonight, that we're able to read words from heaven, words from our Creator, words that can be understood, words that must be proclaimed and explained and applied. And this is what we're taught to do, read the Scriptures, explain the Scriptures, apply the Scriptures. God's given us words that are to be obeyed. The God who gave these words, preserved these words, and now has entrusted these words to His church. So that what we have in the Bible is the sum of those words. The Bible is the Word of God. God has revealed Himself in, in words. Something else we see in verse 9 about the Bible, the Scriptures, not only has God revealed Himself in words, these words are faithful words. The elder is to hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, katatain didikain, that is literally, it reads, according to the teaching. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word according to the teaching. So what he has in mind here is a man is preaching the faithful word of God, and the way you know that he's actually preaching the word of God, the way that you know that his preaching is actually faithful is that it's in accordance with the teaching. What he has in mind when he talks about the teaching is the apostolic standard. You know a man is preaching the faithful Word of God when his preaching agrees with apostolic doctrine. The fact that you have apostolic doctrine, the fact that you have objective truth, a standard of truth by which a man's preaching can be measured, reminds us that God's Word and God's Word alone is trustworthy. Anything God has revealed 
If a man's message is true to that which God has revealed, you know his message is faithful because God's word is faithful. In Acts 20, 32, when Paul meets with the Ephesian elders for the last time, he says, and now I commend you to God. I'm leaving you. I'm not going to be able to spend time with you anymore. I know you won't see my face anymore, but now here's what I'm going to do. I'm commending you. I'm turning you over to God and to the word of his grace, which, that is that word, is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I trust God and I trust his word in your lives. I leave you with God and with his word. And I know that his word is able to build you up and accomplish everything that God means to accomplish in your lives. I think, uh, I think about 2 Timothy 3.16, which says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. If we take the end of that, which I've just read, and we start with that. If I ask you, how can a man or woman of God be fully outfitted? How can we see their lives complete and equipped for every good work? The answer is, it's by the Word of God. It's by Scripture that has been breathed out by God. This is how God's people's lives are developed and equipped for service. The sum of all of God's words is truth. Psalm 119 verse 160 says that. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. As I said once before, you can take this book in your hands and just write right along the top of it, truth, <laughs> because that's what this is. The sum of all of these words is the truth. William Mount said this, he said, the gospel is trustworthy if it corresponds to the apostolic preaching. If a particular presentation of the gospel, right, the gospel does not correspond to the apostolic message, as is the case in Crete, then it's not trustworthy and is not the proper object of devotion. We'll deal with this more next week, but you see in verse 10, there was a real problem in Crete. There were many who were insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers especially those of the circumcision party. They were distorting the gospel. And so here Paul is saying regarding these elders, these must be men who will not let go of the trustworthy word. That is the word that's according to the teaching, the word that corresponds to apostolic doctrine. So God has revealed himself in words and those words they're rightly understood and rightly interpreted. We're talking about a word from God that is absolutely, completely trustworthy, faithful, inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient. This is what God has given us in His Word. This also means that the revelation is unchanging. That's why a man's preaching, verse 9, can be measured by a standard must hold firm to the trustworthy word according to the teaching. There's, there's a standard by which preaching is measured, the, the word of God as given through the apostles. That standard never changes. Truth never changes. And we can be thankful tonight that that word is perspicuous. That is to say the word of God is clear. God has given us a word that is inexhaustible, and yet it is accessible. The simplest saint, anyone who has eternal life, anyone who has the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, has access to the Scriptures. You can take a newborn Christian and put a Bible in their hands, and they will benefit from the Word of God. Able to learn the Scriptures, able to understand the Scriptures able by the grace of God to live out the Scriptures. The Bible is an amazing book, isn't it? I mean, when you evaluate it as a whole, it's like a great 
body of water that has some parts shallow enough that a child can wade in it and other parts deep enough that an ocean liner can sail in it. Deep, but also fit for young ones in the Lord. Or it's like land that has flat, lush grasslands and then mountains so high and canyons so deep at the same time that you have to take the time to climb, to ascend those heights or to descend into the depths to be able to mine the truths that are there. In fact, if you take any one doctrine, you can understand that doctrine in a simple way or you can take that same doctrine and it will take you to the deep part of the swimming pool. (laughs) The same truth. This is the nature of Scripture. So that when I say that the Bible is perspicuous, that it's clear, what we don't mean by that is that it doesn't require rigorous study. I think we get confused about that sometimes. We say the Bible's clear, and so people think, well, yeah, it's just, it's just all easy to understand. That's not true. All the Bible's riches are not like diamonds sitting on the surface of the earth. You've got to dig for some of it. Peter acknowledged this, didn't he? 2 Peter 3.15, he says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. I love that. Here's an apostle talking about the writings of another apostle. And he says, you know what? Some of this is tough to get, tough to understand. In fact, he talks about a danger associated with that deep doctrine. He says, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Here's Peter already acknowledging Paul's writings as scripture. And he says there's, there's some things in Paul's letters that are really hard to get. So when we say that scripture is clear, we don't mean that it doesn't require rigorous study. What we mean is that God has given his word in normal, straightforward human communication. It's not a book that requires a mystery set of principles to understand it. This is how some people approach Scripture, like you understand it mystically. It's not really, the the, the meaning is not really found in the words. The, The meaning is found in the reader or the meaning is found in the listener. No, God has communicated in such a way that the meaning is found in the words. And you study those words in the same way you would study and understand any human communication. Those same principles are brought to bear upon our interpretation of Scripture. And so we understand this is a book that means what the authors intended when they wrote it. The worst question you can ask when you study the Bible is, what does this mean to me? Can I tell you, it doesn't matter what it means to you. It matters what it means. Here's a good question for you. What would this mean if I had never lived? What would this mean if I'm off the planet tomorrow? Scripture has a meaning, and that meaning is whatever the author intended when he wrote it. And that means when we study the Bible, we're asking, okay, what did the author mean when he wrote it? And what did his audience understand when he wrote it? What did he intend for them to understand? And what I'm saying tonight is when you use normal, when you you pay attention to the normal laws of communication and interpretation, you can arrive, you can arrive at what they intended to say. The meaning of Scripture does not escape us if we practice faithful hermeneutics. And so it's a book with single meanings but multiplied applications and implications. And because it's a book of objective truth, it never, its meaning never changes. Now the world changes. Cultures change. Human beings don't change. That's a myth, isn't it? That people are evolving. No, they're not. People are the same today as they were 2,000 years ago. Isn't it amazing what what our sinful, sin-sick culture thinks of as evolution is actually, I don't even know if it's a word, devolution, right? We're moving backwards, not evolving. We're regressing. We're going backwards. Homosexuality is not new. 
It's very old. It, it, it belongs to every culture that crumbles from within. The idea of, of interchangeable roles for men and women, no, no clear distinction with respect to gender and, and all of that. That's nothing new. There was a feminist movement in ancient Rome. Human beings don't change. Truth doesn't change. But times change. Culture changes. So, as we study the Bible, we, it's like John Stott said, we stand in two worlds at the same time. We have one foot in the ancient culture in which the Bible was given and one foot in the modern world in which we're living. So what we have to do as we study the Bible is we go backward before we can come forward. We go backward and we pay attention to history and grammar and syntax and context. We understand the meaning of Scripture as it was originally given. Then we ask, now what are the applications and implications for my life and your life in this world in which we're living? And when you study the Bible that way, because truth doesn't change, what you're going to gloriously discover is that you find yourself in fundamental agreement with every genuine Christian who has ever lived. You can go back 2,000 years and you're going to find yourself in fundamental agreement with every Christian who has ever lived if you interpret the Bible rightly. I'm not saying that we won't find differences among us in secondary matters. I'm saying when it comes to the life and death issues, when it comes to what Christians must believe to be Christians, when it comes to the truth of the Trinity and it comes to the truth of who Jesus is and what He came to this earth to accomplish, when we think about salvation by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, you will find yourself in fundamental agreement with every Christian who has ever lived because the Bible has a meaning outside of us. And that meaning never changes. The truth is always there to be apprehended. We can measure preaching by whether or not it agrees with that truth that has been delivered through the apostles. So God has revealed Himself in words. Those words are faithful words, and those words don't change. The message doesn't change. 2 Timothy 1.8 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, His prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, which He gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which... I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Timothy, you've received sound words. God has revealed Himself in these sound words. You've received them. It's like a deposit that's been entrusted into your hands. Now, son, you guard it. You hold fast to it. can't hold fast to sound words unless there's such a thing as objective truth. You can't even call something sound doctrine unless there's an objective truth that exists outside of us, that it would exist if we were not here. And here it is. Here's the truth. Now we must hold to it and believe it and guard it and teach it. 1 Timothy 1.3 says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, Remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love. It issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion 
desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Timothy, understand what you've been entrusted with because this world is full of people who use the Bible for their own ends. They identify their teaching with God's Word, but they don't understand God's Word. They distort God's Word. They twist God's Word. They are not faithful stewards. They are not submissive teachers. They are self-willed. This has always been the threat from the very beginning. This is the threat today. Does a man handle God's Word faithfully? That gets to the very nature of what Scripture is. God's self-revelation that is absolutely trustworthy and that is fixed, unchanging from generation to generation, which is why we can speak of this like a baton passed from one generation of believers to the next that must be guarded by the power of the Spirit of God. All preaching and teaching measured by the apostolic standard. This is what Jude was moved to write about when he says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith, that objective, outside of us standard of truth, passed down to us, contend for it, fight for it. So when we look at verse 9, the first thing we see is something that has to do with what we have now in our hands in the, in the Bible. That is a word revealed by God, trustworthy, never changing. Preaching is measured by it. Which leads to the second thought tonight, and that is what we know about true shepherds. Once we have this clarity in our thinking about Scripture, now we can have something that we know for certain about true shepherds. Because as you're examining men for the ministry, you're looking for a shepherd's commitment to this body of truth. What do we see about true shepherds in verse 9? Well, first of all, we can say they cling to the Word of God. When it says he must hold firm to the trustworthy Word, that's what it means. He clings to it. He holds fast to it. He will not be moved away from it. He is trustworthy as a steward of God's message. True shepherds are careful exegetes, thoughtful expositors. They realize that their task is simply to say what God has said. That's my task as a preacher. That's our task as elders in this church, to simply pass on to the church what God has said. And we realize that none of us is inerrant, but we are doing our very best to handle God's Word in a way that we don't have to be ashamed of one day. That's hard work. To handle Scripture properly is hard work. And that's something that men who aspire to be pastors need to get into their minds and hearts. You cannot be a faithful pastor if you take a lax approach to the study and to the proclamation of Scripture. I think that's an especially important word for this generation. Because we're living in a time where relationships have broken down, right? I mean, even the family is in such disarray generally speaking, in our culture. People long for relationships. And so there are men who want to be pastors, and they're, and they're relationally driven. And they don't really have a, a desire for the work that goes on in the study. They just want to spend time shepherding people in sort of a life-on-life -life kind of way. And there are other men who are not relational at, at all, and they just want to spend all their time in the study, and they don't understand the importance of actually engaging the people that they preach to. What we've got to realize is faithful shepherding meshes those two things, marries those two things, where you work hard in your study of Scripture to make sure that you get it right to the best of your ability. You get it right. But then also you realize you don't just preach publicly, you preach house to house. 
And so there's the work not only of public proclamation, but individual counsel. As you share the Word of God on an individual level, you're interacting with the people of God in a personal way, not just a public way. But let me say this, especially if your task is to be the pastor teacher in a church, if your task is to preach the Word of God regularly, publicly, and you had to ask, which is, which is more important, that I do my work in the study or that I'm meeting people at a coffee shop? You will love the church best if you spend that time in the study and make sure that what you have to say to the congregation as a whole is sound and solid and truthful. Do not shortchange your study time. Do not go to the pulpit half prepared. I like what Ian Murray wrote as he introduced Joseph Elaine's A Sure Guide to Heaven. He said this, describing Joseph Elaine. He says, His warm disposition found him many friends. But if their visits interrupted his studying time, he had no leisure to let them in saying, it is better that they should wonder at my rudeness than I should lose my time. For only a few will take notice of the rudeness, but many may feel the loss of time. I mean, if I don't study, if I don't stand before the church and, and be able to say, I've done my best, many will feel the effects of that. I can't let that happen. Well, I think it's possible to explain our study time in a way that's not rude. But if, but if we had to make a choice, understand young man in our seminary, understand young man who's looking to shepherd one day in the Lord's church, you cannot handle the Word of God lightly. It's not yours, it's His. And we will give an account for how we handle it. So these are to be men who cling to the faithful Word, which is to say they trust the Word of God. What does this say to us about shepherds? Why are they clinging to the faithful word? Because they know it to be faithful. They know it to be truth. They know it to be absolutely trustworthy. If I can get at what is true and deliver what is true, then I am walking in what is faithful and I'm giving people what is absolutely faithful. Say it another way, they're convinced of the sufficiency of Scripture. It's one thing to say you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Do you believe in the sufficiency of Scripture? That it's enough. It's enough to equip you for everything you need to be a faithful servant of God in this world. Are you convinced of that so that what you hunger for is to know the truth? But there's something else we can say about them. They cling to the Word. They trust the Word. They submit to the Word of God. Faithful men preach the Scriptures standing under the message. Not on top of it. Under the message. What do I, what do I mean by that? I mean they've come under the power and the authority and the influence of that message in their own life. So that when they go to preach the Word, the power of the Word of God is not hidden behind the man. It's unleashed through the man. Now, God's Word is of such a nature and power, it can affect people's lives even through unfaithful vessels. You know, there have been people converted under the preaching of lost men. I mean, the Word of God is powerful all on its own. But the more faithful a man is, the more submissive to the message that he preaches the more one will sense the presence of God, the voice of God through his preaching. And I, and I confess to you, that's even hard to explain. I just know it's a reality. You won't miss it. And I think the reason why is, is because when a man has come under the power of the Word of God in his own life, even as he's preaching it and teaching it, he is reverencing it. Even as he's preaching it, he's loving it. Even as he's declaring it, he's cherishing it. Even as he's declaring it, he's digesting it. Even as he's declaring it, he is submitting to it. It's not let me tell you how you ought to live. It's let us all hear God as he tells us how we ought to live. We all come under the authority of this message. 
Faithful men are humble men. Faithful men are servants of the word. So God has revealed himself in words. Those words are faithful words. Those words are unchanging words. Therefore, true shepherds cling to those words, trust those words, and submit to those words, even as they declare those words. Which tells us something, third point, what we know about true shepherding. Three certainties with respect to faithful ministry, faithful ministers. We, we learn something about Scripture here. We learn something about shepherds here. Now we also learn something about shepherding. Five crucial words. They're all crucial, but five I don't want you to miss in verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, according to the teaching. Here they are. So that... He may be able. Six words. So that he may be able. In other words, only this kind of man can do the work that shepherds have to do. He's got to be this kind of man so that, in order that, he may be able to do the twofold work of ministry. I'm going to talk about that twofold work in just a moment. But before we get there, just think about that connection. If he's not this kind of man, he can't do the work. His relationship to Scripture equips him. Did you get that? It's his own relationship to Scripture, his own relationship to Scripture that equips him to do the work with Scripture. Devotion to Scripture accounts for the man as well as those whom he instructs. He's instructing you in a perspective, in a commitment that explains his own life in ministry. When he says, hear the Word of God, hearing the Word of God is what has equipped him. It's what explains him. It's what explains his life, his ministry. He's not preaching a book to you he doesn't believe. He's preaching the book to you that his own life has been transformed by. His convictions regarding Scripture constrain him. It's because he believes about the Bible what he believes. It, it hems him in to a certain kind of way of doing ministry. It compels him forward in that way of doing ministry. When somebody really believes in the sufficiency of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, then the sufficiency of Scripture, when they really believe that, it shows up in every way they do ministry. And if they don't really believe that, it's going to show up sooner or later. I mean, you've really got only two kinds of men in the world when it comes to men who are associated with the ministry. You've got men who believe... God, with respect to the means that God has ordained to accomplish God's work, and you've got pragmatists. Either, either Christ builds His church, and He's ordained to build His church through the means that He has identified. Prayer, the Word of God, loving shepherding, all those things you see in the New Testament. Either you believe that God is going to be, build His church His way using His means, or you're going to be someone who thinks you're going to figure out a way to do it different, better. And you know what? You can put a man into a church that believes in the sufficiency of Scripture, and he can operate within that church in a way that still is pragmatism. Well, this is the way we do it here, so this is the way I'm going to do it as long as I'm here. But if that really isn't a matter of conviction in his own heart, if he is not convinced that God does his work his way and that Scripture is sufficient, you take him out of that context of a faithful church, put him somewhere else, and his pragmatism is going to show up every time. Let me put it to you as simply as I know how. The message is the method. How does God transform? How does God save people? How does God sanctify people? 
How does God take us from the very beginning to the very finish? I mean, God's the one who does it. We're not trusting the means in place of the means giver. But how has the means giver identified he's going to do it? What are we going to trust? What instrument do we trust? I'm saying to you, the message is the method. Very quickly, keep your Bible marker here. We're going to come right back. But look at John 17. I know you know this well. I want to remind you. John chapter 17. And look at verse 17. I don't have time tonight to preach an entire sermon on this text, but I just want to tell you that if you look at this, what you have is Christ interceding for his people. That includes everyone down to this day in this room. Because in verse 20, Jesus said, I don't ask for these only, that is those who had already trusted in him, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That includes you. And in this prayer, he talks about those who've been given to him by the Father, before time, loved by the Father like the Father loves Him. And, and God the Father has loved God the Son from all eternity. So this prayer stretches from eternity past, and then Jesus prays that one day we'll see Him in His glory. Now this stretches to eternity future. So from eternity past to eternity future, everything from conversion to evangelism, everything you can imagine that has to do with the Christian life, it's covered in this prayer and sandwiched right in the middle of it all is this, verse 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Speaks of a great work that is to be accomplished, sanctification. And in this context, he's not talking about positional sanctification. He's talking about progressive sanctification because he's praying for men who've already trusted in him. He gave them, in fact, again, I don't have time. Go through this prayer and notice how many times he identifies these people with his word, with the word of God. You're going to be amazed at how this is a people set apart from the world by their relationship to God's words. He's given them words. They believe those words They've held fast to those words. He, he identifies the people of God with the words of God. And now he's saying now, from the time of their conversion to the time of their glorification, how are they going to be kept in this world? How are they going to be kept in the midst of this unbelieving world? How will they be kept from the enemy of their souls, the devil? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. This is the great work to be accomplished, progressive sanctification. It's a great work that will certainly be accomplished because Christ has never prayed a prayer that goes unanswered. He, he prays perfectly. So this is something that is certainly going to be accomplished. How is it going to be accomplished? In the truth. God's people are going to be, going to be changed in the truth, and he specifies what the truth is. Your word is truth. The message is the method. The message is the method. And when you hold that in your heart as a conviction, you are going to read Scripture, explain Scripture, apply Scripture, exhort God's people to live it out. And in that way, God will build His church His way. Look back, if you would, at Titus chapter 1. So, this work requires that kind of man a man who holds this as a conviction in his heart. He holds firm to the trustworthy word according to the teaching so that he may be able to carry out the work of shepherding. So what is his work? So that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. It's simple, isn't it? You teach people healthy doctrine. You protect people against unhealthy doctrine. You've got to be a man of the Word so that you're able to teach people what is sound for their soul and to rebuke those. I mean, a shepherd is not just gentle. He's also fierce. He's gentle with respect to sheep, but he's fierce with respect to wolves. And so he's able to lovingly instruct the sheep of God, the people of God, in what is healthy for their souls. But he is also able 
to rebuke anyone who contradicts it. That's the twofold work of shepherding. And you can't do this if you're not a man of the Word of God. If you don't believe that God's revealed Himself in words and those words are trustworthy and those words don't change, if you're not a man who clings to it and trusts in it and submits to it, then you'll never be someone able to instruct people in sound doctrine and to defend them against the wolves that are out there. And Paul drives home the point that this work is urgent. You see the first word of verse 10? We're not going to deal with it tonight, but do you see the first word there? For. Why do we need these men? Because there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party, they must be silenced. How do you silence deceivers? You silence them with truth. You silence them by teaching the truth. And this is absolutely necessary because if you leave them without rebuke, they upset whole families. They ruin people's lives. This is why the men who are to serve as elders in the church not only are to be above reproach in their family life and above reproach in their personal life, they must be men who are unmistakably, unflinchingly devoted to God and His Word. For that will explain their family life and their personal life, and that will equip them, make them able to do the work of shepherding, which is to instruct in sound teaching and rebuke anybody who contradicts it. So let me ask you, what do you really believe about the Bible? If you're thankful for your Bible, would you say amen? Amen. God's given us His Word. What a joy. What is your relationship to the Bible? What are your convictions regarding Scripture? What are your convictions regarding the work of the ministry? Do you believe that the message is the method? Do you believe that God's Word is sufficient so that you are someone who's able to do the work called for in this verse. All of you won't serve as elders, but you know what? Every one of us has a responsibility in some sphere of teaching the truth and rebuking error. And so may God equip us all to be able to give instruction in healthy teaching, sound doctrine, and to be able to rebuke those who contradict it. And the church would say, amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your precious word. Thank you, Lord, for making us a people of your book. You have created in us a love for your word and a devotion to your word. And I pray that you would increase our faith so that our convictions would be strengthened. And at the same time, Lord, I ask that you would grant us wisdom so that as we hold to the truth and speak the truth, we can say in a self-examining way that we do so in love. Keep us, Lord, from any kind of pharisaical spirit. Keep us from any kind of attitude that would not represent the the love and the grace and the gentleness of Jesus. Lord, teach us what it is to hold to the truth firmly, but in a way that's gracious. And we ask you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.